I'm an associate professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Um, I'm in the Department of Fisheries, Wildlife and Conservation Biology. And I'm a, a plant ecologist. I do a lot of work in wetlands um, and lakes. And I, my overall focus tends to be on ecological restoration and invasive species management and other applied issues. And I've had the good fortune of collaborating with Kara and Joe and others on wild rice research for, I think, coming on about five years now. Um, so I will tag in Joe. Yeah, th thanks, Dan. Yes, uh, my name is Joe <coughs> Gravine. Um, the program manager for a wild rice program here for the at the family of Ban Ojibwe. Um, yes, uh, really enjoyed the, the the honor to be a part of this uh, this invite. And I want to thank Dan and Kara for 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 asking me once again to co present. Um, been you know as Dan said, been in collaboration for well, probably the last five years. Um, I've been uh, I'm. Uh, I guess they, they, they classify me as a, a TEK specialist, uh, knowledge holder, I guess, uh, you know, things like that, but I'm a hunter gatherer, harvest race, you know, um, hunt, fish, trap, all of that. Um, and uh, just a little background, uh, like the Flambeau man has about 24,000 total acres of wetlands, 14,000 of it is uh, marsh. And I'll pass it to Kara. Hi everyone, I'm Kara Santelli. Um, I'm faculty in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, I'm a biogeochemist and um, originally started out working in oceans. Uh, even though I grew up here in the upper Midwest, I'm actually from Minnesota, <laughs> uh, but had a, had a brief stint working on oceans and have migrated back to Minnesota. and. Uh, now interested in freshwater systems, have been working on wild rice and um, looking, doing other research in wetlands. And um, really, I, one of the, my interests is in understanding how pollutants move through the environment, um, especially thinking about like how microbes might transform pollutants, uh, for example, from like a hazardous form to a non-hazardous form. So some of my research is very applied as well, um, but I'm really happy to be here uh, with you all today, and um, you know, this is going to be uh, us talking about some of our work, and then we really hope you'll be thinking about questions for us. Uh, we we're going to end actually just to give you a heads up. We're going to end with some questions that we often get asked, but we'd love to hear your questions about um, working working together on on issues that are important to many people. So. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think Dan, maybe are you just going to introduce quickly an overview of how we're going to start things off today? Yeah, yeah. So you, I think you can all see my slides. I know you'll you'll let me know if you can't. And we've we're all sharing one slide deck, and we'll kind of drop in and out as presenters. And this is an overview of what we'll talk about today. Um, Joe is going to kick things off by providing his perspective. Um, I'll talk about some of the sort of basic biology and ecology of wild rice, and then we'll get into some of the threats to wild rice that we're concerned about and um, trying to do research on and that Joe is working on as a manager of wild rice. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the lessons we've learned as Karen and I and others on the project as, you know, quote unquote, Western scientists about working respectfully with tribes. And while we're academics, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the same principles apply um, in a variety of professions, you know, for consultants or agency folks or other people working in wetland habitats. And then, as Karen mentioned, we should have a good amount of time at the end for Q&A and discussion. And I'll uh, turn it over to Joe. All right, thanks, Dan. Yes, so um, so coming from, uh, from an indigenous perspective, um, so to, to start off um, way back when, um, you know, the cultural and spiritual significant significance to to the Ojibwe people or the Shinabe people is, uh, is through, it's, it's tied in through our prophecies 
our origin stories and so we have a migration as you can see we have a migration route and uh there's some debate on when when that happened uh, we, uh some of us say it was about 500 years ago um so and then so they say that there were seven actually seven stopping points from from the St. Lawrence to where we're at today in the Great Lakes region, but there's actually there was actually a lot more, a lot more um, stopping places than that. And then, you know, some went north around Lake Superior, um, you know, come down, come across uh, lower part of Michigan, uh, um, Illinois, up up to Wisconsin, you know, Madison, Kenosha, Green Bay area, and then some came through uh, Sioux Saint Marie that way and. Through Upper Michigan and in the lower part of Lake Superior to Madeline Island, and um, so that um, that you know, in, in a nutshell, that's you know, kind of the you know how we how we got to be here, um, and and kind of the, the significance you know to us and and, and for me personally, it is um, the when we established uh, residency here in the Great Lake region, we branched out. Um, to different parts of Minnesota, Upper Michigan, um, Upper you know, Peninsula, Northern Wisconsin, um, Ontario, <clears throat> and so as, as time went on, the um, fur trading, you know, fur traders, they, they came in and started, um, you know, working with the with the, with the tribes here and, and collecting furs, guides, and things of that nature. And um, so then, when uh, the state came in and they um, were going to force uh, try to remove us to Minnesota, so what had actually act happened is, is one of um, actually a couple of our chiefs here from right from from Lac du Flambeau, other known as Washwaganin, which translates. Um, in Ojibwe is Lake of the Torches. And uh, so they, uh, they, they had um, a summons, uh, uh, a, a person that was related to one of the chiefs and they, they ended up going to, to Washington DC to, to stop the removal. And, um, and hence the uh, last treaty with the Ojibwe is 1854, which established the reservations. Um, we ceded, we ceded those those lands, and and within that, in those sessions, the the chiefs had asked that we uh, retain the right to harvest rice as we once did, and and so that's the that's the importance you know, to us, to me. Um, there's many, uh, um, there's. Re many uh, social um, dimensions to this, uh, spiritual, cultural, um, you know, and, uh, you know, I don't know if, uh, Dan, if there's another slide in there that, that kind of points to what I'm about ready to talk about next. So we talk about travel harvest stewards, you know, we've always been uh, the stewards of the, of, of Monoman. Um, the picture on the left is, is um, people harvesting, um, uh, from the Prairie Island Indian community. And uh, I'm on the left-hand side uh, doing uh, uh, what they call wild rice density surveys. So even though for hundreds of years, you know, that, um, you know, we've been doing this, you know, and, and, we're, and we're still doing it, harvesting, you know, trying to take care of the monoman, um, wild rice, you know, you know dealing with, uh, Many factors um, that are threatening wild rice today, Monoman. Um, and, and so there's, uh, so there, there's, uh, so we do family, family. You know, there's a lot of families that are that, that do this uh, every year. Um, I've been doing it for the last like, forty years or better. Um, you know, there's, uh, I got relatives that. We go out and harvest with we parts rice, we process rice together. So there's that whole, so there's there's families that are involved in this whole process. Um, every um, late August, early September, that you know they're they're gathering rice, you know, dealing with the worms and the bugs and all of that. And and nowadays, today, you know, one one of the 
the things that you see today, you know, in, in harvesting rice is you see a lot more, a lot more males, a lot more male figures out harvesting rice. And that hasn't always been the case. There's always, you know, um, a lot of the, the women back in the day used to harvest rice. There's still some that, that do it, um, get out and harvest, but for the most part, it's uh, uh, kind of a male, male dominance type thing now. So, and, and then with that, um, yeah, so there's, you know, there, there, there's, uh, for me, you know, being, being the wild rice, the wild rice program manager, um, and incorporating those, those teachings, that knowledge that, that I've, I've gathered over the years, um, that, um, you know, I've been, been able to apply and share with, with our collaborators, with, with the University of Minnesota, or, um, you know, and, and bringing those two, uh, bringing traditional or, you know, like, you know, a lot of people have different ways of saying, you know, they got traditional knowledge, TEK, indigenous knowledge. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of in between uh, indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge. <laughs> um, but uh, so, yeah, you know, it's this, uh, so I, I apply a lot of those, um, a lot of what I know just through my own personal experiences being being a being a hunter gatherer and you know pretty much all my life my my father and all my siblings they were hunters and um, some of them gather rice uh, um out of the family I still trap so you know I'm still carrying on on my on my dad's tradition so um so this being being able to to um have that knowledge of of the landscape that I, the, the landscape that I live on, you know, that, that I, um, not only here in our, our reservation, but outside of, outside of the reservation that, you know, being able to walk through the lands and, and, and do the things that, that I enjoy doing, you know, um, brings that, uh, come to understand how, how some things work, you know, I have a lot of questions, you know, and, and I have a lot of theories, you know, that, why things work the way way they work, and you know through this collaboration, you know the, the science part of it has been able to, um, I guess, validate, um, you know, some of my my theories of how things are the way they are, and and you know so that, that you know that you know, that's it's important. You know we have. Um, I guess you know we have established wild rice chiefs here uh, within our within our reservation within our tribe. Um, there's another picture, you know, Drew Savage found a lot of and rice, and um, on the right there is uh, so that's uh, we still carry on we still carry on these uh, these um, these teachings these ceremonies and um, so the one uh, the one with the pails that's actually in my backyard you know cooking. Cooking uh, for our wild rice feast at the uh, University of Minnesota Biophysical and Social Science people have been a part of, you know, to participate. That's traditional. That's traditional um, cooking right there. You know, it's uh, it, it's some of the best tasting food that you know you can pull out of a pull out of a, a cast cast iron a pail or a, a you know a bronze pail. Compared to pulling something out of the microwave or stove top stuffing, you know, but uh, it's just uh, it's really good, really good, and, and uh, so that's so that's you know back to what I was saying, you know, we we're still carrying on, you know, these uh, these ways of life, these you know ways of living, you know, you know trying to live in harmony and, and balance and and respecting the given that that respect to Monoman as you know, to what was foretold in our migration, you know, to where the food grows on the water. And that's uh, pretty much Great Lakes region, you know, and and, and today, uh, most of you may know or may not know that, you know, at least in northern Wisconsin, you know, and other uh, places in Minnesota that rice is on a decline. And um, I don't know, really know what what is happening there, but, you know, through through our continued efforts and, and practicing, you know, what was passed on to us through our, through our um, ancestors. And, you know, we, um, we're still carrying on that tradition. We're still looking forward 
you know, after Herman Ullman, Wild Race was still, you know, protecting them. We, we still believe that we're still the stewards, the caretakers of Manoman. Um, um, so yeah, it's just, uh, that's pretty much I, I have on that, you know, and, and I guess, you know, you know, one thing that, one thing that was, that was shared with me by a good friend of mine, he's uh, kind of like a spiritual advisor, uh, pretty, pretty knowledgeable in, in things. And, and, uh, he goes when, when, when we offer, when we offer our, our tobacco and we say these prayers, uh, th these prayers have been said before us, same, very same prayers that our ancestors have said. And, uh, you know, like I kind of thought about that, you know, and that was, that was, um, gonna make sense, you know. And so with that, um, that's pretty much what I have to say on that. I don't know, we got another slide there anywhere, uh, Dan? Yeah, thank you, Joe. Yep. Thank you for uh, yeah setting the the table for us and talking about the importance of Nomen. And I'm going to talk now, um, as I said, about some kind of basic biology and ecology of this plant. And you know, you'll hear us use different words throughout. It's you know one species, many names: Manomen, Ojibwe, Piscean, and Dakota. Um, Northern wild rice is a common name, and then Zuzania blustris is the scientific name. And, you know, one of the things um, I, I'm just excited about plants in general. And, uh, you know, when you think about rice, where it fits into the evolution of the plant kingdom, um, it occupies a pretty important place. And that is in the grass family, which, you know, as well in the as wetland scientists, you all, I'm sure, spend a lot of time with grasses, um, but that's really the, um, you know, family we can trace so much of human nourishment to all of these global staple foods and wild rice. Um, while it's obviously very distinct from, you know, white rice um, in a lot of ways, it is within that same tribe, um, Perizidae within the grass family. Um, and it occupies a unique and really beautiful habitat. It's um, an aquatic annual grass. And I think that's something that's pretty important about it. That we'll talk more about is that this is an annual species rather than a, a perennial species like so many of our wetland plants are. And it, it needs these particular conditions. Find it in slow flowing streams and in lakes, uh, clear water with stable, shallow depth, less than about three feet, and on these mucky soils. And this is a, a really beautiful image made by Wisconsin Sea Grant and others that is showing this um, annual life cycle from, um, you know, the seedling germinating around now all the way to the emergent growth form, um, hopefully with good grain for people to be able to harvest. And this is, you know, sort of an approximation of when these different life stages are happening. Um, but from a perspective of kind of threats to wild rice, Joe mentioned this decline that's been happening. You know, I, I tend to think of it from this perspective of these sorts of life stages that this plant needs to get through um, from being, uh, you know, a seedling um, in the muck under the water and then growing through that water column, um, capturing enough uh, sunlight for energy that it can make it there energetically. And then it has this floating leaf stage where it's gathering, you know, able to photosynthesize a lot and gather a lot of energy to become this robust, rigid, emergent plant um, growing over the water. And it's wind pollinated, and then those flowers ripen into the nutritious grain um, that Joe was describing. Um, and it trans Monoman translates as the good berry or the good grain. And 
you know, maybe less so for this audience, but I often find when I'm talking to people about wild rice, um, it's important to describe this distinction that, you know, there people can mean two different things when they talk about wild rice. What we're talking about today is a wild species um, that's hand harvested in the traditional ways that have been done for centuries. Um, but then on, you know, grocery store shelves, it's predominantly this cultivated paddy grown rice that was developed um, in the 1950s by agronomists at the University of Minnesota. And there's been a lot of um, tension and issues between the University of Minnesota and tribes as, as a result of this. And there's, there's a long history that we don't have time to talk about today between the University of Minnesota and tribes around wild rice. But, um, you know, there's quote unquote wild rice, which is the, you know, the black patty rice you get in stores. And then there's the true wild rice, the monoman that is so uh, tasty and varied in color and texture. Um, and, you know, there are people, you know, describe the unique taste of the rice from different lakes. And this is what we want to see. This is Perch Lake on the Fond du Lac Reservation. Um, and we want to see situations like this, where we have these vast expanses of nearly monotypic looking, um, wild rice. Those are the conditions where people can get a really good harvest. Um, and as Joe mentioned, um, that right to harvest is protected in law and, um, you know, those treaty rights, tribes ceded territory to the US government in exchange for those rights to hunt, fish, trap, and get, gather, as Joe described. Um, and they've been upheld across multiple challenges. And we're, we have this, uh, you know, complex landscape of these ceded territories. And so it's enshrined in law that um, tribal members have the right to gather wild rice, but then whether or not it's there and available is. Uh, another matter and is really, you know, kind of the key conservation question. And this is showing what Joe was describing that there's been these long term declines. So, what we're seeing here, this is work out of UW Madison um, showing historic versus current watersheds known to have wild rice. And what you see, and it's especially striking in Wisconsin, is that there's been that um, shrinkage of wild rice's range and distribution um, where where it once was 100 years ago or so it's no longer being found and what that can look like on the ground is something like this these are um, Glyphwick, the great lakes indian fish and wildlife commission performs aerial surveys of um, wild rice waters for their member bands and this is an example of what that can look like, where on the left we've outlined, a, you know, strong bed of good dense wild rice, and on the right that same water body with the wild rice gone and replaced with the floating leaf vegetation. So, why is this happening um, in Minnesota? The issue of sulfide has received a lot of attention, and Kara will talk about that. Um, but there are so many factors that uh, can affect rice. And so something that we've been focusing on in our research is hydrologic disturbance. And again, thinking of that kind of gauntlet that the wild rice needs to go through, starting out as this uh, seedling that could be easily uprooted um, and the floating leaf stage where you know these plants can be drowned or if the water is too fast, there's too much disturbance. Um, the rice can be killed um, before it gets to this, you know, pretty tough, you know, sort of hardy emerging growth form. Uh, another important issue is contaminants. Um, it needs clear water and, you know, obviously there's so much eutrophication across the upper Midwest that can make it so that the young rice is not getting sufficient sunlight for growth. And then another issue uh, Kara will talk about is um, the potential threat, the threat of sulfide. Okay. 
Dan, can you just go forward one slide? Okay, so um, many people have probably heard about, uh, you know, the issues in Minnesota specifically related to sulfate um, and the sulfate standards, you know, it's a big flashpoint in the state of Minnesota. And so um, I just want to kind of give a background just so everyone's on the same page of where this all comes from. I'm not going to talk about the sulfate standards so much because it, um, well, a lot of this is all in flux, of course, <laughs> and also because it's not really the focus of our research. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, when, when we talk a little bit more about the work we're doing together um, with the university and, and tribes, um, uh, our partners have come from all over uh, uh, the Great Lakes region. And so um, they, the work that had been done that I'll show you that was already done to look at the relationship between sulfate and wild rice um, that was that was work already being done and it and it wasn't affecting everyone and they wanted us uh, our partners wanted us to look much broader so thinking about you know hydrological disturbances and other things that we're going to be talking about um, but I do want to give some background because obviously it's so important right it's it's really shaped politics <laughs> uh, around wild rice it's shaped a lot of things in the state of Minnesota in particular um, and so. So where does this all stem from? Um, and a lot of it started a long time ago with early studies by a state biologist named John Moyle. Um, and he was looking at wild rice distributions. And one of the major findings is that um, when he looked across the state of Minnesota and he made all sorts of different correlations, one of the major, major pieces that he found was that we you didn't typically see wild rice growing or at least growing very well um, in waters that contained high sulfate concentrations and so anything greater than say 10 parts per million sulfates um you know you, you started to see an inhibition or less abundance in terms of the wild rice stands and then anything higher than 50 parts per million um sulfate you didn't typically see sulfate so you didn't typically see wild rice growing um so he made that observation right and he didn't describe the mechanism it was sort of you know you know at that time it was more focused on you know this observation of sulfate um and so there's been a lot of work done to try to understand that relationship um and where this might be a factor so dan if you go to the next slide so just to uh, show you, so this map on the right is a follow-up. So the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and others, uh, even including researchers here at the University of Minnesota, um, did a huge survey to kind of go back to this um, and, uh, and, and kind of re remap this and look at a lot of different factors, you know, through statistical analyses and other things uh, to make these correlations. So on the, on the right, you see a map of Minnesota and uh, the color scheme that you see, so uh, it represents the concentrations of sulfate. Um, and I'm realizing it must be in ppm. So uh, blue, that blue, like upper northeast area, is low, very, very low concentrations, like 0.1 to 5 ppm. And then this gradient uh, across the state. Uh, to like the southwest part uh, where or central, you know, western part uh, where you see much higher concentrations of sulfate. And these are natural con concentrations, right? This is this is the state of Minnesota. For the most part, it's natural concentrations. Obviously, you see the bullseye, which many of you are probably familiar with uh, in northern Minnesota, northeastern Minnesota, uh, the Iron Range, um, where there are in, uh, increases in sulfate abundance in lakes and waters, or lakes and rivers. So this kind of shows that. And then they mapped on top of that. You can't see like the circles and how they're filled, but it just kind of shows the densities. And the point of it is that you have much higher densities where you see low sulfate. So just another confirmation, although the MPCA study took it took it much further. So next slide. Yeah. So going back to this area and and 
you know, I'm sure many of you in the room are familiar with this, this flashpoint of Northern Minnesota and the relationship of iron ore mining. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, when, you know, in this area, typically, you know, before iron mining, there would have been low sulfate. So, you know, we, we know that the, the high sulfate concentrations are a direct result in this case of iron ore mining. And so, the the process is you know as you're you know uncovering these rocks and processing these rocks um, the any sulfur that's in the environment is oxidized to produce sulfate that sulfate gets released through various processes into the lakes and rivers right so now we have many many water bodies like throughout that Great Lakes region you can see the concentration those red dots on the map those, the bigger the dot, the higher the concentration in the water body that was measured. So you can see that really high concentration of high sulfate, which typically would have been a low sulfate environment. And so when they looked at that, then that those areas have, you know, very uh, diminished amounts of wild rice. And we have, you know, a lot of oral histories, right, to go off of. We know from oral histories and from working with our project partners, like the 1854 Treaty Authority, uh, we know that there used to be abundant wild rice in these lakes. That's very well documented, um, and and now there's not. So so what is it? What is causing this decrease? What is the relationship specifically between sulfate? Is it sulfate in particular or something else? So Dan, uh, yeah. So is the question then became is is sulfate toxic to wild rice or is it something else? And the answer is sulfate in itself is not toxic to wild rice, actual sulfate. What has been determined through a number of different studies, uh, there's been a, a, a number of scientists at the University of Minnesota Duluth, John Pastor, uh, Nate Johnson, Sophie LaFont Hudson, and a few others who've really kind of done a bunch of work, uh, mostly through growing uh, wild rice under uh, specific conditions in mesocolumn experiments that they're doing. And what they were able to show is that what happens is you can see on the picture on the right, if you have, you know, wild rice growing in an organic rich environment, like a, you know, mucky lake bottom, river bottom, um, and those roots are growing in that, in that or very organic rich environment, you naturally have bacteria in those, in that environment who will reduce, transform, you know, reduce sulfate. Sulfate is the oxidized form of sulfur, right? And that's what's being released in the, in the mining waste. So the sulfate that's in the water gets reduced by these bacteria to produce sulfide. And that sulfide is what is so toxic to, to the wild rice plants. And so the more organic matter you have in the environment, uh, the the faster these processes work, these these microbes just thrive in these environments. Uh, so you're there's nothing you can do to stop that. If sulfate is there, if that, that's the risk, right? If sulfate is there, and you know you, you can't really shut down these processes. <laughs> these are naturally happening, right? So if organic matter is there, uh, microbes are going to be there, and they're going to in an anoxic environment where it's very mucky, uh, they're going to reduce sulfate to sulfide. And we know through all these experiments done by others that this is what is toxic. So, okay. So some people have pointed to, well, you know, and this is where the uh, things get complicated because um, there were also uh, some evidence looking at, okay, well, what can buffer that, right? What what could we do to mitigate that? And in the environment, what uh, researchers by the MPCA and by these University of Minnesota Duluth uh, researchers found is that if you have a lot of iron in the system, sure, it's the iron range, right? like there's, there's a lot of iron available in this system. And if you have uh, reduced iron, so aqueous iron 2, for example, which you typically have in these mucky lake bottoms, streams, wetlands, right? There's a lot of iron. What will happen is that iron, that aqueous iron, will, uh, will interact with the sulfide produced by the bacteria, right? And you'll get a chemical reaction that happens, and it'll precipitate iron sulfide like a solid iron sulfide 
phase, right? And then that becomes, that like locks up the sulfur, right? Like that locks up the sulfide. It makes it not available for the plant to take up. Uh, so the, you know, there were, you know, there, it is known that if you have high iron in the system, it will precipitate a lot of the sulfide. So that was sort of a idea of like how to buffer the system against all this sulfur is if there's iron around. Um, and there's a lot of complexities to that. So even if you, Dan, if you go to the next slide, you know, precipitating that iron sulfide doesn't help either in, in many ways. So this is a picture of uh, wild rice roots grown in those mesocalcums um, by, by the researchers at University of Minnesota Duluth. And on the left, you see uh, the roots are all black, and that's because they're coated with this iron sulfide mineral. And on the right, um, those are more natural looking roots that you would typically see if you pulled up most plant roots, right? So the, the root system is uh, exuding oxygen into the environment. It's precipitating iron oxides, coating the rice or coating the roots with iron oxides. That's a healthy system. But on the left, when you precipitate all these iron sulfides, uh, they've shown they've done research to show that this also inhibits plants. Maybe it doesn't kill them necessarily immediately, but what they find is that there's fewer seeds overall, fewer wild rice grains overall, and smaller grains, which is going to impact things over long term, right? So if you constantly have this iron and sulfur coming into the system, um, over the long term, maybe it won't kill it immediately, uh, but eventually you're going to sort of diminish the stands because you can't reproduce enough um, for this annual grain to continue to to um, regenerate itself. So, um, yeah, Dan, you can take it back. All right, thanks, Kara. Um, so I'll just cover a few more sort of stressors and uh, one of them is dominant perennial plants. You know, we've been emphasizing that wild rice is an annual species. Um, as somebody who, you know, does a lot of work on aquatic invasive plants in wetlands and lakes, one of the things that's been interesting for me in learning more about wild rice and about um, habitat management by tribes is the issues with native wetland plants that can just um, sort of take away that open habitat. Pickerel weed um, being a classic example. Um, and one that, for example, um, Fond du Lac Band um, invests a lot of effort in managing pickerel weed um, to keep that habitat open for rice. And then, of course, invasive plants like hybrid cattail uh, can be a factor as well. Um, so you can have situations like this where you have these long lived perennial plants that. Um, because of changes in wetland hydrology and disturbance regimes can kind of get a toehold in these areas that might have been wild rice habitat in the past. And then because they are perennial and clonal and long lived, um, even then, if you have kind of a restoration of those historic hydrologic conditions um, or reintroduction of disturbance regimes, you can still have those perennial plants um, staying dominant and persistent. And then something I'll spend a little bit more time talking about um, is climate change, which has been uh, one of the areas we've been doing research on in the last few years. Um, and of course, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about the future of wetlands from a climate change context, uh, both in terms of temperature and precipitation changes. And this is an area where tribes have really been um, national leaders in um, assessing vulnerability of different plants and animals to climate change and developing adaptation plans. So this is from uh, Lac de Flambeau from Joe's tribe. Um, and this is their climate resilience initiative where they identified wild rice as extremely vulnerable to climate change. And you'll see that's gonna be a recurring theme in, in a number of these assessments. Um, Glyphwick, uh, the Intertribal Council of Michigan, and then the 1854 Treaty Authority and their member bands have also done vulnerability assessments and adaptation plans. 
and you consistently see wild rice being um, the most or among the most vulnerable species based on these assessments. And Glyphwick just released their um, second or an update to this assessment. And I think this is a, a really effective image. This is covering um, plants um, that are important to them. And it's showing the Ojibwe name on the left and then the common, oops, common name on the right. And then um, with also the vulnerability score. And you can see wild rice monoman really sort of stands apart in its acute vulnerability to climate change based on these assessments. And then we see, you know, some other wetland plants like sweet flag and arrowhead down here. While there's vulnerability, it's not the um, as dire, most likely. Um, and then just from our friends north of the border, this is an assessment of Great Lakes coastal wetland communities um, by Canadian universities and agencies. And this is looking at, I think, something like um, 80 different wetland plant species that occur in Great Lakes coastal wetlands. And once again, same pattern of wild rice really sort of standing apart in its vulnerability. Um, so why is that? Um, I think it's because the effects of climate change are so uh, multifaceted when we think about a species like wild rice. Um, there's temperature components, precipitation components, and beyond. Um, and again, here I'm showing that in the context of these key life stages in its annual growth cycle. So. Um, in terms of temperature, it needs that um, cold, wet stratification of the seed, um, those germination cues from a long, cold winter to tell the rice, yes, it really is spring, it really is time to grow. Um, and so shortening of winters or um, warmer conditions could disrupt that. And one of the graduate students who's a part of our project, Serena Torres, is investigating that in the lab with some germination experiments. And then um, the spring water levels need to be hospitable to these young plants that could be drowned or uprooted. And then later on, there needs to be enough water in the late summer for harvest. So, um, you know, we've seen in Minnesota with this drought. Um, I can't recall right now if it was last year or the year before where there was actually good wild rice growth, but there wasn't enough water for people to um, harvest it to get out in canoes and be able to harvest the rice. So all of these conditions need to be met. And then, of course, there are, you know, pests, disease, competitors, or common carp are extremely harmful to wild rice. Brown spot is a fungal disease that's likely to increase with warmer um, temperatures. And, you know, things like other plants like hybrid cattail are not going to have any trouble with climate change. So there can be um, sort of more displacement of wild rice is what we're worried about. And then something that Joe really helped us think about and that we're working on with him is thinking about the whole watershed um, and how our changing forests in the Great Lakes region could be affecting the, the overall eco-hydrology of these wild rice watersheds. So as we have, for example, the shift from um, what were historically conifer forests as those are becoming more deciduous, that could be affecting the way water cycles through these systems in ways that um, could impact rice. And next, I'm not sure if this is Kara or Joe, so I'll just I'll mute myself and let one of them talk. Joe, I think you were going to introduce this. Do you want to talk about the slide? You're muted, Joe. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, I, I said I must have had a blank spot yesterday when we were, <laughs> when we were looking at this. But yeah, so this uh this this here um um 
slide here that this you know talks about so you know, what our collaborative you know what are working with the university as a partner our biophysical team the whole you know the whole project and and other um other um, partners that are involved we um, have worked with some of our students and, and our, some of our pis here uh, dan and kara put this together so the whole project uh, um so we uh, what we have the the word i can't pronounce it i'm not really fluent in in um, my my language but uh but basically what that stands for is, is first you must consider monomen so that is why that's in the center and then so all of these sort of sediment plants, uh, geochemistry, all of that. So all those are, are connected. So we, it's uh, not just kind of looking at one specific thing. Uh, it's um, it's it really you know, looking at you know everything, policies. You know what policies are um, helping or not helping, protecting wild race, not protecting wild. You know, the whole ecology. You know, so that Dan was saying you're looking at the whole. You know, the, the, not just one specific watershed. Looking at all all the watersheds, uh, for example, uh, Lac du Flambeau. We we sit in uh, four watersheds. Um, uh, the fourth one, we're just kind of like on right on the corner of one. So we got so we're 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 pretty we're pretty fortunate, pretty lucky, and it's just uh, you know so our animals, uh, the people, you know, talk about the climate. You know the plants. You know, you know. It said, look at. Uh, we talk about invasive species, Dan. You, you know, you hit it right on, the, right on the head. You know, it's just, and I'm sure, you know, some of you, you know, are aware of this that, you know, our native plants are being more invasive, out competing, out competing, um, you know, other plants, you know, um, uh, wild race. I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen it. I, I see. I've. Notice that you know in more recent times, maybe the last 10, 15 years, more cattails, more pickerel weed, more um, um, lily pads. So, you know, all, uh, we've seen a lot more of that. And there's there's a num number of things that are affecting that. So we talk about that the people. We talk about animals. So we got muskrats that they're coming in. Um, uh, and eating rice stocks. Uh, we got uh, people. Uh, Early and early on, you know, we used to have, we used to have a lot of trappers, you know, that, that kind of kind of managed, you know, um, muskrat and beaver populations. Uh, so then sediment, you know, Dan we talked about that, you know, looking at the uh, looking at the, the forest cover, you know, all all of that, you know, climate, um, water, uh, to, you know, it's you know this, you know, I could talk about water. One of the things that that I've that I've noticed is, is that our instead of getting our May showers and st stuff like that, you know, getting those thunderstorms in June and July, they're actually they're actually coming more towards the middle of August, uh, um, uh, September, right right during our harvest season. A lot of times, right when our monoman when we're out harvesting, when the race is ripe, and uh, you know, I can just say, you know, last year. Um, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, we had, uh, uh, our rice bed, one of our good rice beds here on the river here got storm damage, but, you know, um, so, so sharing those things and, and, and talking about conventional, you know, you know, talking about science. Um, so like, so I'll just talk a little bit about like the sediment on, on one of the sites that, that we have, that we're, um, have here that, um, the biophysical team is working on. So we have one area, right? So many, many years ago, this used to be, um, so there's a dam um, before it at the headwaters. And then, uh, so there used to be a wild race through that whole system. And uh, and so now there isn't anything. So what, so one of the things that we found out of that was, was um, is that we got uh, 16 feet of sediment, 16 feet of sediment. And, and and our river, our riverbed is five feet. So it it's uh, really got some questions. So then, so so when we talk about water we have hydrology, and, and so so over time, the um, there's been changes. A new road bridge that was put in over over part of this part of the river. 
or the, you know a lot, lot of different things so i used to guide canoe trips i used to uh, guide whitewater canoe trips so i, so I kind of understand how you know how 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 a river flows you know you, just, you study you study those currents you know you can throw a stick you know, in in that in that current and watch where it goes so those so those types of things and how how that how that river meanders and how it don't meander and, and so so what what uh, what what my knowledge and my theory uh so the plants uh the percolo weed um is, is blocking my theory is that the percolo weeds are blocking that current from actually going in and 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 providing that necessary flow that that rice bed needs so that's kind of you know kind of you know looking at this slide here and this um you know, kind of bringing those two, two um, indigenous knowledge and, and Western science, kind of bringing those two together. As I said in my when I was talking, you know, it has validated, you know, some of uh, you know, validated some my theory. You know, and and it's uh, I mean, it's just you know, so that the Western science has validated that indigenous knowledge. And, and and I think this is really, this is really, I think it's really important, you know, that, um, that, uh, you know, it's just never, we've, we, we've never been able to, um, I might be getting off track on this, but, you know, indigenous knowledge has never been, uh, never been, uh, I guess, even considered in the past. You know, it, it's like, well, we, well, how do you know that you don't have no, you don't got no, uh, data you know got you know you got no um you know research or you know things like that you don't have no funding that supports you <laughs> you know that that whole thing you know so it's just like well you know and it's just you know it's but you know that just is really it's just really kind of kind of puts it this this slide here really what it really puts it in into in front and center you know with the work that we're doing with this model here that's that was put together Yeah, thanks, Joe. Yeah, I think it's really, I mean, what Joe said is, resonates with me so much. I, uh, as a Western trained scientist, um, you know, I used to, as a biogeochemist, think of myself as a pretty interdisciplinary scientist. <laughs> and then I started this project <laughs> and then I realized I knew very, very little. <laughs> I I was, you know, we're, we're often trained as these like really siloed scientists and we have these siloed disciplines and we don't always integrate. Uh, and even when we do, like maybe I'll work with Dan or something, but um you know in the grand scheme of things bringing in these other knowledge systems really strengthens our understanding of whole systems um and strengthen it in the ways that are, go beyond that sort of transcend the science that sort of you know it brings in the relationship side of things it brings in personal sides of things and um i don't know it's one of the greatest joys of working on this project because <laughs> uh it's just it really has taught me a lot and it's taught me a lot about like how to do science in projects in partnership with people in an actual partnership because uh as you many of you probably are trained in sort of the western framework there's a lot of power dynamics at play um and one of the goals is to like not only just bring these different knowledge systems together but to respect that there's probably still power dynamics at play, but try to figure out how to mitigate that. And so anytime we're, you know, I'm working in projects now, having done this work, um, I think about that a lot and how to minimize, minimize the power dynamics at play um, in any sort of partnership. So um, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was recognize that there are many, many people who are contributing to sort of the project work that we're talking about. Um, we're not going to talk too much about the science that, uh, like, in terms of, like, the major results uh, from the science perspective, uh, but we want to share the process because the process has honestly been probably the most important and I think relevant to thinking about whether you're a government, you know, whether you're working for a government agency, for consulting, you know, whoever it is, um, I think that's really important. And, um, Dan, can you go back one slide? 
quick. Um, these are the people, and, and actually this, this is a little outdated. We need to update this. Um, there are many more members, but the, the point is, is that there are many people contributing to projects like this and emphasizing that, you know, Typically, as university researchers, we're taught to be the experts and we are taught to, you know, learn about the system and, and maybe it will benefit the people that we, we intend it to benefit. Um, but you can't really truly do that <laughs> without a true collaboration and respecting other knowledges and uh, expecting other uh, and actually bringing people in. And so the people that are listed in red are um, either individuals who are native or represent or or individuals who represent like tribe tribal uh, resources management or other things like 1854 treaty authority and, and whatnot um and so you can see the huge number of people in red who contributed uh, to this project which makes it a success right i mean you know I, I think that's like one of the most important things about bringing people into work like this um it's hard to for me to really um, be respectful on working on such an important topic um, if I'm not doing it in collaboration with the people who are um, have the most at stake um, in something like this, uh, specifically around wild rice. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so we do this a number of different ways. We um, have formal collaboration conferences um, where, you know, this, this is a, Often a way to come together at one place, we invite, you know, our project partners, but also community members and that we have informal collaborators, some that just want to learn and listen. Um, and so, and, and then our formal collaborators and we all come together. Um, we share cultural experiences on the bottom left. You see uh, a drum circle. Um, from Lacta Flambeau, the Wigwam Juniors, who will often share um, their drumming with us, which is really powerful. Uh, but it's also a time to more formally reflect on, you know, what the goals are, what are um, some of the, you know, things we're learning, what are the things we're concerned about, how to move forward together. And that is part of a really important part of the process is uh, in working with uh, our partners, you know, in our tribal partners or any sort of collaboration, this sort of consistent communication, you know, we have these formal collaboration conferences, but then we also have regular meetings. Every month we have a, a formal meeting where we're following up, we're, you know, we're being accountable, we're communicating um, regularly so that we're touching base. And that's a really important part of this process. Um, we do a, a lot of our field work together because, like Joe says, you know, we, you know, I, I only have certain skill sets, right? And I, you know, Joe's been like, if we go to Fon, uh, Lac de Flambeau, you can see Joe in the bottom left. I don't know what he's doing in the canoe, uh, but but uh, he's he, he's guiding us. <laughs> so uh, so Joe is guiding us on you know what he and, and sharing you know where should we be sampling? Where should we be doing our what what questions should we be addressing? Um, what what observations has Joe had from going out for the past forty years? making these observations, hearing stories from, from others um, so we can target our, our, our research and be really targeting the questions that, that our tribal partners have. Um, and, you know, without doing the field work together, it would be pretty hard to have that knowledge of actually where to even really truly to, to begin uh, sampling and, and what is going to be the most effective strategies. So we do a lot of our field work um, with our with our partners. Um, and then the next slide, Joe, I think you were going to talk about the knowledge exchanges because these uh, this one all happens at Lac de Flambeau. Yeah, so so here in this slide here we call it um there's one of the things that I think uh my my former supervisor Eric Chapman he's since retired uh, and I think in one of our, our planning meeting all hands meeting we talked about you know uh, maybe like this knowledge sharing so so we thought about like a cultural exchange and so 
what we're doing here, that's what we did uh, last year. We did like a river cleanup um, with uh, the community and uh, the University of Minnesota, some of the biophysical team, social science people. Uh, Dan, I think you were there. We had Northwestern University there. They came up and participated. And so kind of what, uh, you know, going, uh, starting with the uh, top left slide, you had one of the, one of the uh, undergrad students there is working on uh, making uh, racing sticks or race knockers. And then uh, the second one, the middle slide on top there, we have uh, a good friend of mine. I call him my brother. His name is Greg Johnson. He was a, a very uh, talented um, artist. Uh, he does uh, birch bark basket making and baked moccasins, tanned deer hides and all that. So what he's doing here is he's showing uh, you know, some of the students there in the background um, how to make birch bark baskets. And then uh, here we got Dan. He's working on uh, working on uh, or some another uh, race racing sticks knockers, and then uh, my good friend Bobby Wajesh Williams, uh, who since passed on here a couple years ago, is one of our he was one of our um, our, our spiritual advisors, you know here um, a, lot, a lot of knowledge that that we lost and when he left, and then uh, here we got uh, one of our race chiefs uh, working with. Uh, one of the students in doing uh, core samples. And then uh, so then here we have uh, Jerry Mann. Uh, he was, um, was kind of like our, uh, works with the uh, Fish and Wildlife. He does a lot of our off reservation permitting uh, for deer, deer, you know, deer harvest, fish, all of that, you know, trapping. He, he issues all the permits and gathers all the numbers. And he's a, a, a LDF, uh, Weight Task Force rep for for our tribe with uh, uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Here he is, is uh, doing. Uh, um, I forget what he's doing. I think he's working on uh, setting up a core sample sediment sample there. But that was a four day workshop. So those are just one of the things that you know that that, that we have done and and um, in, in collaboration with with you know with the university you know with. Um, Dan and Kara and many others in the whole university system. Um, yeah, we've, uh, I think we, you know, one of some of the other things too that, that um, I don't know if there's another slide, but uh, we, we've we um, participated in uh, Joan Gable's inauguration when she became president. And then it's just, you know, some of the students, you know, that were, that were a part of, uh, um, uh, that were on, on uh, here on on Flam uh, back to Flambeau, uh, some of the others might be some other places. Uh, you know, we've um, we came to the university, went to the labs. You know, uh, checked out the lac core facility. Um, we met with Joan Gable. You know, number number of people that we met with. You know, so it's kind of back and forth, and and uh, it's been uh, it's been been a lot of fun. It's been a really neat ex uh, learning experience for me. I learned a lot and. And um, I, I'm sure, you know, Dan and Kara and many others um, you know, have um, likewise. Yeah, and one of the, um, I will highlight one of the major outcomes and, and I, I want to set this up so that, because the next slide is really important for sort of laying the framework, but um, one of the things that we, uh, have found to be most important is figuring out, you know, what what makes an effective collaboration like this, um, you know, and what do you need to do to ensure um, that you're not, you know, perpetuating harm, that you are in ensuring that this is done in a good way, in a truly collaborative way, how do you actually collaborate? Um, and so we published this paper and it is accessible and I can maybe sh send a direct hard copy to Rebecca if that's helpful, if people can't always accept uh, um, access these papers. But um, this is one of the papers that came out of it. And the, one of the most important things, uh, so you can see we have a number of the blue names are all the number of collaborators. Many of those are our partners, um, so they have a formal role in the publication of this research. But Dan, if you go to the next slide, 
um, this really lays the framework in how we operate. And I think this is one of the biggest takeaways and things we often like to share with other people doing these large sorts of collaborations. Um, uh, not just, you know, you know, whether it's university or anything um, was, and, and this is a, pr a protocol that we develop for how we engage with our partners and engage together. Um, and, you know, th there's other models for this and there's other protocols and when we built our protocol off of knowledge from other protocols, um, but it was important that we have a written protocol in place. And that is not reactive to like a situation that happened four years down the road that was set intentionally from the very beginning of this project. It was one of the very first things, the very first biggest outcomes of this project, um, because it sets the framework for how we engage, how we collaborate, making sure um, that you know the outputs of these projects benefit everyone, right? There's co-production of knowledge. There's co-production of um, data sharing. You know, everything is done intentionally um, so that there isn't harm being done because there's a lot of room <laughs> for a lot of harm being, there has been a lot of harm done to tribes um, by uh, sort of the traditional Western, traditional sort of the Western science framework of how we engage with people. Um, so I think one of the biggest takeaways that I wanted, you know, we all wanted to share with you is this protocol. Um, this is a an appendix and, you know, we, we just summarize some of the main points here and we're happy to talk more about some of these things that might be of interest to you. We've done a lot of work um, to think about things like decision making processes, to think about how we disseminate our data, who owns the data uh, that we generate, how do we pass on ownership to the tribes, how do we recognize, um, how do we recognize their work um, in this project, um, how do we be respectful to the culture, um, you know, and so you know, we, we're happy to expand on any of these, these topics, but, um, you know, I think this, this protocol is, is really important. Um, and I can't, I can't stress really how important it is, but I've actually taken this framework and, and integrated it into other types of projects, including even working, uh, in the power dynamics of my own graduate students in the lab, right? Thinking about like, what, you know, what can I do to minimize, uh, minimize potential harm, minimize the power dynamics, recognizing that they still exist. Um, how can we be more equitable in, in our approaches to, to science and, and what we do? Um, so um, with that, um, let's see, we, we came up with a lot of questions. These are, these are questions we often get asked. This is Joe working with uh, the University of Minnesota President Joan Gable. Uh, when she, during her inauguration, um, but we we often get asked uh, key questions, and and we have used the word tribal university collaborations because that's what were our experiences. But so you could substitute any word for university, right? You could talk about tribal government relationships, collaborations. You could talk about tribal, you know, you know, tribal industry, tribal, you know consulting collaborations, you could, you could substitute other words for, for university here. Um, and we're happy to answer questions, talk about specific experiences. We recognize that there are differences between our role as university researchers and what we're able to do. Um, but we, we do feel that much can be gained by, by understanding these, these like protocols and understanding how um, we can better um, engage with tribes um, and collaborate, truly, truly collaborate. So we're happy to answer questions, these or other things you might, you might uh, be wanting to know about this collaboration or about wild rice. <laughs> As a reminder, you can um, type your questions in the chat, or I think you can raise a hand and we can unmute you if you're, if you prefer to ask your question directly, but um, I can ask it for you if you are willing to put it in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, 
Um, I had a couple questions come in privately, not on the, the group chat, but um, someone was wondering if Canadian geese have affected wild rice populations. It seems like they're booming. And I guess I could kind of see that hurting or helping maybe. So maybe you could expand on that. You want to take that one, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, that, that definitely, um, definitely is, um, um, We've seen uh, some 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 pretty major impacts on, on at least on not so much on our, our historical wild rice beds like like on our river, but uh, it had they have had a significant effect on on some of my um, receding sites uh, where they've um, where I've, you know that one of our historical wild rice waters that don't have wild rice anymore to try to restore it plant. Plant wild rice there, and um, I, I planted rice there one fall. I came back uh, that summer, and uh, it looked like somebody came in there with a lawnmower. You know, it's just really, it's just, uh, it's it's a challenge, you know, and it's just, um, you know, it's it's one of those things, you know, that how do we, you know, looking at looking at a management side of not only wild rice, but you know manage it a, a resource we should look at uh the regulations for for geese you know at, at uh the they're, they're pretty they're pretty tight regulations when it comes to to goose and swans so it's 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 something you know that so that, those are one of the many challenges that that we have you know and, and trying to um manage and and restore these historical wild rice waters i just want to add to that some um, other stuff um, from our partners that has come up around around geese. Um, yeah, so Joe mentioned, that's interesting, Joe, that you said it's in your reseedings that you notice it. And one of the things I've heard people um, say about that is they think, well, one, it's like goose candy, right? Like the young rice in a reseeding as it's germinating, um, they love it. But then also in more mature established rice stands, maybe it's dense enough that it kind of is, you know, bothers them. It's harder for them to get into and stuff, but then those rice restorations, uh, they can just move right through it really comfortably. And they've been doing, I know 1854 Treaty Authority the last couple of years has been doing some goose roundups. Um, they've been like rustling up geese and I think they've uh, been turning them into food for the zoo. To protect some of those receding efforts. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Interesting. Hmm. Well, they're annoying here too, so hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we can come up with something to make everybody happier. Yeah. Um, you know, oh, go ahead. Just to kind of just kind of to add on that too, you know, I know there's been a lot of conversation around with with swans too, but you know, I'll, I'll tell you something. You know, I've with the wild rice beds that we do have here, I haven't really seen swans eat rice you know like the stocks or anything but I, but that don't mean that they ain't happen but it, it just seems that that um that uh, even though that they're, they're being more you know they're being more and more and more of them every year that, that to me i just um i know we have like uh i've counted like three pairs of swans on on, on our river in this area but and i see more i see more geese Doing damage when I do swan, so you know that that's that's a debate too. Interesting, um, especially with the drought last year, and then the fact that it seems to be flooding now. Who knows what's going to happen this year? But how sensitive is the rice to the changes in water fluctuation? Does it have like a sweet spot that really affects it, or? Yeah, the 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 the, the sweet spot is. Three feet, three to four feet, but you know it's uh, four feet is like the max, so it's just, you know three feet is that is that sweet spot there for a wild race. So was it hit really bad last year with the droughts, or? Well, you you know it's it's you know it's I guess it it, it depends you know um, uh, at least from from my observation from from what I'm from what I've seen here in in our area. Is just like uh, so. Like I know, it's like some of the lakes, you know, some of the lakes that have dams on them, 
the uh, they seemed like they had a little bit more of a problem, but like our like our river system, it it is like man, we've had high water, you know, later on in that in that time frame. But I tell you, the the, the race I mean, the last few years has been the race that I've seen on there has been astounding. You know, it, uh, you know, like I, I talked about my friend Greg there, him and my other buddy there, Boise, they, they um, on their one particular race, but 400 pounds of finished race. Finished race, 400 pounds. And just in that one race, but on the river. And that was, we had high water. The, the, the current was, was, was pretty, pretty strong, you know. So, I mean, it's just, it, I, I guess, you know, I, I guess it's the, uh, you know, um, well, how do I want to say that? I guess it's how how the landscape, you know, the characteristics of those bodies of waters, you know, that wild life goes out in the lakes, seem to suffer a little more than 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 rivers, at least from what I've seen here on on the reservation here. Um, I know you had that whole slide up. The one thing that caught me that I wanted to ask a little bit more about was the do no harm research, but I'm happy to hear more about that whole slide. Um, there's a lot to take in on there, but that one really caught my eye and I'd like to hear a little bit more about that if you guys could expand on it. I mean, I can say one thing. I mean, you know, a lot of times we don't realize we're causing harm <laughs> by our research. A lot of times it's not in, always intentional, but by being ill-informed, by not doing your homework, by not understanding, um, Cultural practices, for example, um, you can actually perpetuate a lot of harm. You could be sampling on lands you might not be, uh, you, you should not be sampling on, for example, if you're not careful. Um, in, in the case of wild rice, another contentious issue, of course, is cultivated wild rice, right? So if you're doing research that might somehow inadvertently um, harm tribes' ability to control wild rice in, in their ecosystem, like in their lakes, like maybe maybe the cultivated, there's concerns about like the cultivated strands getting, you know, drifting and taking over the natural stands. So there might be something related to that. There's also a lot of true harm being done that maybe is more egregious um, in the past, like, um, and that tribes have a lot of concern about, like, genetic sort of uh, manipulations uh, of strands that, you know, could take over and what that means, not only from a perspective of the, of the, of the ecosystem, but also just the practice of it and, you know, doing this work without consent, um, you know, you know, one of the, uh, uh, conferences that we went to, someone likened it to sort of, um, you know, taking something from their grandmother, you know, taking the DNA from your grandmother and using that a, a, and just like selling that information without permission sort of thing. Um, so not, you know, some of it is more egregious and more, um, you know, you 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 should probably you know should be more aware, but then some of it is actually really unintentional because you're just not informed about the the desires and wishes and needs and cultural practices um, of where you're working. So I hope that kind of Dan and Joe might have some other perspectives. No, uh, I think that's that's well said, and I think. Um... Yeah, uh, one of the things that I hope, you know, thinking about students coming out of University of Minnesota, and I'm sure a lot of you probably have degrees from here, um, is I think there's just a need for sort of more basic understanding of um, tribal sovereignty and treaty rights, like understanding that tribes are sovereign nations with their own governments and permitting processes and research approval boards. Um, and understanding treaty rights and that just because you're not on reservation land doesn't mean um, that there aren't uh, tribal rights um, and tribal resources that could be impacted. 
Yeah, I guess you know, I, I, you know, kind of. I'm gonna go off what Dan was talking about. So, um, yeah, that was. I, I think you know, um, the and and Kara kind of kind of alluded to it too. Is you know, so as I mentioned you know, when I first started out, so we have so we have these uh, uh, federally uh, recognized treaty rights. So you know that 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 uh, we have that inherent right to to harvest wild rice. Um, be kind of co-managers with, I guess, you know, with the state of Wisconsin. And, and a lot of times what happens is, is um, um, you know, I'll just take, uh, you know, chemical herbicide treatment from aquatic plants. So one, there's a lake here outside of the reservation, probably about, I don't know, probably about 25 miles. So that's pretty close to us, you know, and, it, and then uh, the, the, the lake itself don't have wild rice, but the stream does. So they were applying this. They were applying this. Uh, this herbicide, and uh, we caught wind of it, and said, "Hey, what's going on?" You know, and it's you know, so it's like they didn't even consider or you know reach out to us, say, "Hey, you know," and, and a lot of times, so we got like so here in Wisconsin, we got uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission that that represents you know, eleven tribes. Then we got eighteen fifty four thirty. So a lot of times, what federal agencies or you know. Um, Forest Service, uh, EPA. A lot of times, what they'll do is is they'll send these consultation letters or things to to Glyphwick and not specifically to the tribes, thinking that that you know, Glyphwick or eighteen fifty four treaty speaks for for the tribes, and that's not the case. And a lot of times, when when we catch wind of it, we usually send a response back requesting, you know, you speak to speak to us directly. You know, we you know because you know some of these areas. I mean, they, they, they're, 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 there's, there's cultural sites, there's known cultural sites, and things like that, and it's just, you know, and it's not, and it's not even, and it's not even, you know, I, I don't, it's not even um, that, you know, it's just a, it's a neighborly being respectful, you know, hey, you know, we, we may not have the answers, you know, there's a lot of times, you know, when, when they do something, whatever kind of research whether by herbicide or whatever they, they well we're going to pick this lake or we're going to pick this chunk of land and they don't even know the history of that so so reaching out to, to tribes and saying hey you know anything about this body of water you know any you know you know anything about this forest um yeah it's like oneida county forest first they, they reach out to us all the time and say hey you know on a specific site there's some stuff going on here we want you to participate. So when I had account forest department been really been been really um on the ball with that as far as that. But that's just you know, I just think it's, you know, one of those things, you know, that that you know tribes could be helpful. Very helpful because they they know the history of whatever particular lake where um where uh, you know a wetland specialist or a res researcher may not know. You know, so so it's good to good to reach out to tribes, you know, especially if you're in close proximity, you know. You know. But we we like to anything that goes on in North Dakota, Wisconsin, whether it's mining or you know logging to specific areas. Well, we're we're on it. We want consultation. What's the plan? You know. So uh, we're, we're like the flammable's pretty. Uh, we're, we're pretty uh, in the loop on some things, and we we try to get try to get in get that consultation. So. I see we have someone who raised their hand. Tony, are you able to unmute yourself or are you still locked? Oh, you're locked. Okay, let me try something. Sorry. You might be able to do it now. Hello, hello. Yep, we can hear you. Perfect. All right. Hey, thanks a lot, guys, for hosting this. Um, really good to hear some of the stories there, Joe, and the interesting information. Um, you know, from, a, I guess, maybe more of a, like, practitioner, somebody that's in the field doing restoration work, you know, I'm always thinking, like, we would talk a lot about, we talk about challenges that face wild rice abundance and um, threatens the, the, like, the geographical extent of wild rice. Um, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, it's, I think it's maybe a little bit more of a feeling, so I'm not sure if there's a full-blown holistic data set that would show this, but, like, do you guys feel like the, outcomes of this particular project are being utilized to bolster 
wild rice. So are the things, are, are the outcomes being realized, you know, the things that you guys presented here, you know, whether it's Western science or, um, you know, the TEK, is that really being, now that you realized it, you see it, like, is it being deployed across the land? And is that effectively improving abundance of wild rice and distribution? I'll take a stab at this and from stuff that I've been involved in, I'm going to say no, like that it's still aspirational um, in terms of actually being able to contribute to on the ground management. And, and Joe might have a different perspective on this, but I feel um, like we're learning and we're working together and we're making progress and we're addressing important questions. Um, meanwhile, tribes are doing a lot of on the ground management, you know, habitat management, water level management, reseeding. Um, but I don't feel like as a project on the biophysical side that we've gotten to a point where we can say, you know, based on the research we've, we've done, here's a management recommendation and then see that follow through and actually succeed that that's a goal i have and a place i'd love to get to but i don't feel like we're there yeah i can i guess i can add to that um to uh to what dan was um talking about there you know he he may not see it but i do <laughs> you know it's uh so a lot of a lot of the data that's been shared that's been gathered already uh it's like the aquatic plant in site one you know that that has proven validated my my theory again you know that that uh you know the, the native plants are out, out competing wild race you know and, and what you know it's what we're getting 16 feet of sediment so I, so that it's it, it's heading in that direction for me to to help establish uh, a wild race management plan for the tribe and it and and the it's gonna it's gonna set up a plan for that specific area and and so when you talk about wild rice management plan it, it it's it can't be a, a one all for all bodies of water because every every wild rice bed waters is different the characteristics are different and everything so yeah so i i that's what i see you know and 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 to one you know it's uh so one of the things that that um has happened to this partnership through this collaborative is, is that um it brought it brought back um our wild race ceremony our wild race feast it brought that back to this community and um and as a result we're we're, we're seeing these steps you know it's 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 a gradual you know with with wild with our work with wild race um you know like i was saying you know guys gathered 400 pounds of finished race so I mean that and that race race stand has been it's been doing pretty good. It'd be interesting to see what what it's like this year. We got water all the way up to the bank. The rivers that's the highest I've seen our river in a long time. But it'd be interesting to see how how that is. But you know, to answer that question, yes, I, I mean I see that part of it. You know, the work that we're doing, you know. And Joe answered that beautifully, so I'm not going to answer that. <laughs> I really like Joe's answer. <laughs> That's cool to hear. That's oh, I'm sorry. What question just came in as you guys were talking? Sorry, I almost said we were done. Oh, it's from Tony. <laughs> Do you want to voice out loud, Tony? You can still unmute. No, okay. Um, I think it's just a thought. I'll let um, I don't know if it's. In, you want me to read it out loud? Still on screen or yes? Okay, great. Um, so he has said sometimes uh sorry, there's a typo in here. Sometimes it's one step forward, two steps back, or two steps forward, one step back. Sometimes a lot of work has to go into protecting existing beds and not expanding beds into historic ranges. So he said he needs three more hours of this presentation to fully expound his thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> keep that in mind um yeah so that's the last question i have and i see we're at four o'clock and i don't want to keep you guys too late because uh i know you probably have the sunshine to enjoy let's all enjoy spring while we can right hey, can hey. i just can i just yes of course can i answer his answer his uh yes his, his question yeah that that is tr tr truly 
um, right, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, sometimes, you know, so that, so it's like, so when you, so when we do, when we do field work, right, when, when we, when we do want to do a wetland restoration or a wild race restoration, so it's just like, well, you know, a lot of people have questions, you know, it, you know, it's no, no kind of impact does it have, no matter what we do, what kind of work we're doing, we're going to have an impact, but what are we going to manage, what are we managing for? And how are we going to manage it? And what are we going to include in that management? You know, and that, and that's I think that's one of those things where, you know, what Tony's talking about. How do we get in those 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 back and forth things? You know, it's just sometimes sometimes we're not we don't have that ultimate ultimate C. You know, it, you know, it's just like sometimes we got you got uh, state representatives, you know, higher higher ups, you know, that are are, are saying. They either put the stamp on it or they don't, you know, and that's just, and, and a lot of times, a lot of times we have the answer. We have, we know, we have this data that's, that supports that, but it's just, what are we, what are we going to manage for it? And then I think include those, if we're going to do uh wild race management, well, okay, what are we going to include? What, you know, what do we include? We got, uh, we got uh sweet flag, we, you know, we make sure we protect that. You know, we got a, a trout pond over here, so we're we're not gonna mess with that beaver dam or or whatever. You know, so but yeah, that's a lot, a lot, definitely a lot of back and forth. But you know, it's just gotta, it's gotta have people like me uh, saying what's on my mind and just put it right on the table. You know. <laughs> I like it. Thanks. All right. With that, um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate seeing you today and learning a lot. I learned a ton. So thank you. And um, everybody's released, I guess. Thanks thank for you. Us. It was fun. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been, been an honor. See you, everyone. Yeah.